I've made a lot of changes to my Final Fantasy XI setup to make it pop the way that it does in 2021 since the last time I made one of these videos. Uh, I'll link those two videos in the description below, but if you're curious when I did to get Final Fantasy XI looking like this, it actually was only really three things, and I'll go through the steps right now. Now, my goal for this video is mostly to explain what I'm doing and ultimately what each setting is kind of actually changing so that if you don't like one, you can uh, tweak it, alter it, remove it entirely, whatever you feel like. If you guys feel as passionate about Final Fantasy XI as I do, then changing too much can can be kind of a bad thing. It, it takes away some of the charm and the mystery that this game evokes, and I, I don't want to do that. I'm constantly changed in look to, to better bring back the original art design, maintain that while giving it a fresh 2021 look. And I always am saying like, is this too much? Is this not enough? What can we tweak? But if you're still here and you're curious, uh, let's get right into it. Number one of the three things, Ashenbub's HD textures. Uh, these textures are fantastic. I highly encourage you to check them out. As you can see, if I kind of zoom in on one of these things, it sort of applies this uh, cartoony effect that Ash and Bubs has painstakingly gone through every texture in the game, both spell effects, the you know uh, equipment, gear, zone walls. You can see it over here applied as well. It's not for everybody. I'm not sure if it's the absolute perfect representation of what 11 always could be because in Ashen Bubs, I mean, no disrespect if you're watching this. The artists that designed the textures knew they had very little to work with, with PS2 hardware being what was driving those textures. So they painstakingly put these little feathering att attempts of like tiny oh, speckles of almost what looks like. It, it makes you think of dirt or uh, texture when it comes to cloth versus metal. And they did it painstakingly with this beautiful detail that causes each piece of equipment, clothing, surface to almost look like it really is what it's supposed to be. Now, it also looks like crap. If you zoom in without the you know textures loaded in, <laughs> they're, very, they're ancient, they're really blurry, they're very low res, and uh, everybody's uh, tried their different attempts on how to upscale those and make them a bit more 2020, 2021. I think Ash and Bubs has, uh, has gotten the closest and certainly with the most all-encompassing experience. And Ash and Bubs, I cannot thank you enough for all the work that you've put in to making uh, Final Fantasy XI really look like it almost could be a modern game. If you're concerned, real quick, uh, these are all loaded in through a plugin called XI Pivot, which works with, which works with both Windower and Ashda. Definitely check it out. It allows you to overload, override, <laughs> reinstall. You you load these textures that you set up in a different folder entirely from your Final Fantasy XI install and replace them dynamically while the game launches. You're not replacing or deleting any files. If you don't like it, you can turn it off immediately. It's one of the best parts. I think it's really allowed Final Fantasy XI to like pop in a beautiful new 2020 way, but I get that it's not for everybody. I get that it does make concessions with some of the original art, art style and design, but I think it makes the fewest concessions out of the HD textures opportunities out there. Some amazingly handcrafted HD textures that have been uh, performed in, in the past and some of the options that people have seen redo some of the color palettes and, and overall art style, I think a little bit too much. Um, and I could never quite get into them. This is all the same color palettes, everything in a fresh new HD way. Ash and Bubs, thank you so much. I'll link both the uh, the general Ash and Bubs HD texture pack as well as the HD beta texture pack, which has all of the textures in the entire game. Um, that's what I'm using now. I've had no issues. Highly encourage you to check it out. Moving on. Next, all that is made possible with the Ashda XI Pivot plugin. Uh, easy to set up, tons of uh, easy guides online. Essentially, you're gonna have them on a separate, there's a, a DATS folder under plugins, or is it under config? Regardless, <laughs> there's a guide somewhere. If you have any questions about how to set it up, ask in the comments below. Uh, I'll respond and then pin that comment or do something of the sort uh, to give a better description. But you'll have a separate folder entirely where you have all the ROM folders with all the files, the DAT files beneath, uh, named like FXI HD. Very easy. Let me know if you have any questions. The only other two plugins I'm using from Ashton right now are the FPS plugin that allows Final Fantasy XI to run in a smooth 60 frames per second and the draw distance 
plugin that allows me to see further than the game was originally designed. Let's head out to uh, Sure to Birder real quick to show you what that looks like. We've talked about draw distance in the past in my previous two videos, but to bring it up again, just so if anybody's curious or it's the first time you're here, draw distance, set world one is the standard Final Fantasy VII experience. As you can see, some of the distant textures over there aren't really even showing up. Uh, the haze, the Final Fantasy XI haze and fog that is from that PS2 era is, is almost right up on you. You can see it even just like at this first little cropping of, of stone. If you do draw distance set world four, which is what I previously recommended, you see a little bit further off into the distance, but that haze is still present in those distant outcroppings of uh, cliffs and stone, but you can see much further. Um, if we are out in a little bit more in the open, you see that there's still sections that are kind of popping in in the far distance uh, for areas of the zone that you can't quite see, which is why I've now decided and started to recommend draw distance set world 10. 10, you can see those distant cliffs that honestly you normally couldn't even see <laughs> on the PS2 version or the original version of the game unless you were right up at the zone line. Um, but you still have some of that fog. And that was my biggest argument before, was I love when you can still see some of that PS2 fog. I think that's an important design decision that the developers made partially because they had to. They had to find a way to like hide the fact that there were no distant textures. But it does give Eleven that kind of like hazy, distant mystery feel, and I don't want to get rid of that. So I want that to still be present. You can go all the way up to 100, I think. But to be honest, all it really does, yeah, sure, in like Meritod Mountains, you could probably see a lot further. But you basically just kill, you squash that, that distant haze. And I think the haze is important. So 10 is what I'm doing right now. Moving on to the last stuff, which is the Reshade plugin. Reshade is a post-processing tool that will apply um, various effects to your game on top of the image by analyzing the, the textures and everything going on in the image to clean it up or change it in different ways. Some of the stuff we've talked about before, levels, vibrance, curves, all change the contrast and, and color uh, of the image to just kind of, in my mind, give it a little bit more pop, a little bit more contrast, and a little bit more color uh, to the overall game design that was previously kind of like a, a drier, blander image, which is beautiful, and I, I love that about Eleven, but that's kind of what sees in bright colors. Let's get, let's get cheerful here, guys. Bright colors. <laughs> Debanding is supposed to help with some of the, uh, the gradient when you see, like, it almost looks like layers of color on top of each other in the sky. I just applied it today. I don't know if it's working yet. Let me know if you guys uh, have used it before and what do you guys think? FXA kind of smooths over the overall image if you ever use this in other games. It's doing the same thing. It's it's analyzing, FXA actually it was always post-processing, so it's, it's truly what it's always done. It's analyzing the image for any um, aliasing, which is that kind of like jaggedy edge thing that you get for certain sides of textures or, or objects when there isn't enough, <laughs> isn't, when there aren't enough pixels to create a perfectly smooth line. I also just happen to like the the soft the softness it gives to the overall image. So I've got that applied with some some low settings. I'm not gonna go super into details for vibrance, curves, levels, debanding, FXAA, about what values I have applied. Tweak it, see what you guys like. A lot of people don't even really like one or all those things. So whatever works for you, it's your game guys, enjoy. <laughs> MXAO is ambient occlusion. Uh, if any of you remember, that applies sort of that deepening dark effect. It applies sort of that, that deepening shadow effect to corners. You can see in, in the grass and near the edges, this is kind of a bad spot to do this, but how we're applying uh, a little bit more a deeper, darker shadow, especially in the, the corners of, of the parapet. Is that a parapet? Is that what we call? <laughs> the stone structure. Somebody tell me in medieval times what this is called, uh, and especially behind the flag. This is one of those subtle effects that you're never gonna notice, but you'll notice when it's gone. Ambient occlusion was one of the, the biggest game changers in my mind for gaming lighting improvements past like 2010. I forget when the first game that introduced ambient occlusion was, but it, it really is a game changer. It, I think, softens the image, makes it more believable. It can be hard to dial in those settings. I'll quick show what I'm using. I'm using high 24 samples. This determines how, how many samples of the image it's using to create its reference uh, post-processing effect. The more you 
you uh, use here, the more accurate it will be, but also the, the more processing going on. It depends on your own machine, what you think that, that balance point of like quality introduced versus loss of performance. I, I think high is a pretty good range there. You can also set to auto if you don't really want, even care. Um, I have the sample where says the four, that is how far out into the world it is uh, in fact applying that effect. As you can see, I don't even have this effect like super blasted out right now. So it's kind of hard to even see. This is a, uh, this is the debug mode where you can see what it's doing. Here, I'll blast up. I currently have ambient occlusion amount set to 0.73. I don't want this to be too much. I just want a little bit applied, but for the sake of argument, we'll set it to like three. So this is this would be a super dark image and it's, a, it's applying some really heavy darkness to some, some areas. I, I don't think this works well with like the floating text in the game. Remember, Eleven is doing some weird 20 year old stuff with textures and like that. There's actually floating text in the game <laughs> that is being rendered, which can be difficult for post-processing effects to like ignore. Uh, so it, it, it's creating shadows for like the Orochi text above my head, which I, I don't really want. So I, I've lowered it to be to avoid that, but you can see that it uh, it can do quite a lot. You can tweak it, tweak it all you want. Blending mode just determines how it's, what mode it's using to blend that effect in with the existing textures of the world. Um, to be honest, I, I haven't really figured out which one of those I like. I've been leaving it to. One last little thing that is cool to know, uh, the preprocessor definitions. These are little effects that, that change how the plugin work that you can't change dynamically. I would set MXAO smooth normals to one and high quality to one. High quality is self-explanatory, just makes it a nicer overall version of the, uh, the ambient occlusion effect. But smooth normals is taking these normal maps and trying to smooth them out in an overall smoother image. Now, MXAO doesn't seem to be doing that as effectively as RT uh, Global Illumination, which I'll show you in a second, but I'm gonna leave it on uh, in case it is working. <laughs> it, it's taking these flat textures and smoothing them into a more believable round shape uh, if that was what was intended to sort of more accurately depict the object, which is made up of flat triangles and squares into like a circular shape like it's supposed to be. But now let's get into the fun one. Ray tracing global illumination. For this one, I'm gonna turn on the lighting channel just so you can see exactly what it's doing. My settings right now are 10 for ray length, uh, extended ray length multiplier. This seems to be a new softening technique that uh, is, is supposed to mimic, I, I think like large, long distant light, like a sun versus like a light bulb. I'm not sure, I'm still tweaking it. I've left it at 0.5, halfway in between uh, on and off. The amount of rays three, I've never seen any performance um, gain by going lower than three. And I certainly don't see any improvement in terms overall like image quality when I go above three. So three seems to be the sweet spot there. That's the default number, uh, amount of steps per ray. You can obviously see the changing of the image by increasing the number of steps. Obviously infinite steps is kind of like real light until that light is literally has no energy left to, to create any kind of visible light source. It'll bounce as many times as it possibly can. Uh, but from what I've experienced, about five seems to be that sweet spot of like, you're getting a lot of accuracy and clarity for a number of bounces, but also not totally destroying the performance uh, of this plugin trying to run, like destroying your computer. It all depends on what your computer can run, by the way. Z thickness. This is defining the, the thickness of the objects in game. What I'm confused about is like, obviously my character and that tree are not the same thickness. So I'm not really sure how that's supposed to work. I've found about 0.3 seems to always be the number that I come back to. Zero is sort of ignores some of the smaller textures and, and objects like uh, mobs, myself, and going up way higher, you get some of that weird ambient occlusion effect on on the character and the name that maybe you wouldn't want, like about all this shading going on, like on the other side of Orochi that isn't really appropriate. It doesn't really work. And I just, I feel like you run into problems more often that way, especially during daytime. And we'll get to that in a second when there's like a super bright light of like the, it's a super bright day in like Quiffum or Valkyrie Dunes. Like you'll see it just like totally blast and wash out the image. So I've left it around 0.3. That seems to be my sweet spot. 
Um, these are some of the new settings that I'm really enjoying. Enable precise light spreading, definitely leave it on. Enable simulation of back face lighting. I've been trying this out. Uh, this is supposed to sort of simulate the idea that if you've got a round red ball on the screen, all I can see is this side of the red ball. So it'll, it'll bounce light reflective uh, off on this side, but it doesn't know that the other side's red. So it doesn't really know what to do with that information. Simulation of back face lighting is sort of saying whatever you see on screen, we're assuming that it's round and the other side is the same color and we're gonna make make up what that would reflect like. It works most of the time. Um, occasionally you might see colors sort of bounce in weird ways that don't necessarily make sense. I'm trying it out. We'll see how it goes. I love the idea of, of bouncing color in space because I think it's one of those believable lighting effects that you can have in game. So I really would love to see this work well, but I know that they're sort of just kind of guessing and they, they admit like by design, this is a guess. By the way, I should have mentioned before, uh, the ray tracing plugin, I'm not sure if there is a free version available now, but it's Pascal Glitcher's uh, Patreon project. Um, Pascal Glitcher has put a ton of effort into making this work. Constant updates are coming out in the beta release of ray tracing. If you want access to those beta releases, you have to subscribe on Patreon to get access to it in uh, in the Discord. I highly recommend you do. It, it's a super amazing plugin. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with it. If if you get it and you're like, you know what, I don't really want the rest of the beta updates. This is perfect for me. You can just subscribe once and then like you're done. Um, up to you. But it is it is really cool. But the best part about this that I've been super excited about is auto sky color saturation. So in the pre-processing definitions of this, again, Smooth Normals, turn that on. Um, sky color mode, there are now three modes. Static color, not super useful for what we're doing. Obviously off was zero. Dynamic detection, which is pretty cool. And dynamic detection with manual tint, that's even better. So if we turn it to manual detection or uh, dynamic detection, you can see how the image got like far bluer. That's because it's pulling this dark blue sky and trying to apply it to the overall image saying like the sky is super purplish blue. It kind of makes sense for the whole scene to be kind of that purplish blue, which I think adds a really cool effect to the overall image. You can We can blast this up a little bit higher. Uh, my current settings for this, are five for auto sky color saturation. I do want to have a lot of that saturation to the sky color. Uh, 0.5 for sky color ambient mix. This is the mix for the ambient colors of the surroundings with the sky color, so half and half between both. Four, I, I've kind of changed the sky color intensity based on the scene. I, I, sometimes I put it at three, sometimes I put it at four. I think three is where I left it after like a, a bad quiffum incident where it was super bright one day and I was like, ah, this is too much. Ambient inclusion intensity was already there. Uh, I've left that at four. That's just the effect, like how dark do we want to darken some of these walls, um, surfaces. It, it is a really cool effect. You can make this as dark or as light as you want. I think it, at night in dark hallways, the higher that number is, the more like overly intense it can be. So I've left it about four, which I think might be the default. Bounce light intensity is the uh, lights from other sources this is how we determine lights that are bouncing off of a colored surface, how much that color comes with. I think above three is kind of pushing it. You sort of start getting colors off of like the grass where the grass itself kind of becomes a light source and that's too much. We just want to see like occasionally, like here, if I go to cast for instance, oh darn it, I don't have anything to cast. Let's just do third eye and then we'll do warding circle. See how we get some of that like light effect and it plays off of the wall and surfaces. Now we'll do warding circle. Again, you just get some of those colors and like blast color into the surrounding area. That's the kind of stuff that you wanna see. Like I wanna affect the walls, the surfaces, the characters around me. I've done it with like ice spikes and blaze spikes and you just get like little ripples of color. It's just really cool. <clears throat> But if you put that number up way too high, you start to get colors off of like, like the grass, like I was saying, becomes a light source. Uh, a blue shield will suddenly put blue everywhere. That's not really realistic. You wanna get shades of that blue, little bits of blue. And finding that that balance has been tough. But guys, I mean, that's pretty much it. I, I'm gonna try and wait till like a nice, beautiful daytime shot that we can get. So you can see kind of like everything in action. Um, I've been tweaking 
Certain areas like Quiffin Island on a beautiful day or, or Valkyrim Dunes, I've been trying to figure out the best balance so you don't get all of the white surface of like the, the sand or snow just bouncing up to everything else and it's super white and bright while still getting these really cool effects uh, at, at night and, and uh, in other zones where there isn't that like intense blast of color. Let me know if you have any questions about how I got any of these to work. Uh, leave them in the comments below. I'm happy to explain it. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail here because there are a ton of guides online explaining how to do reshade, uh, the different settings and effects, uh, probably with better instruction and more knowledge than I could possibly give you here. Uh, especially with Ashda and Windower and XI Pivot, like all that stuff, there, there's tons of guides online on how to get that to work. But if you do have any questions, definitely leave it in the comments below. <clears throat> I'm happy to answer and I can even like pin the comment explaining. So if anybody else had some, some questions, hopefully that answers them. Or join us on Discord and leave your questions there. Uh, I'm happy to try and help explain it it's really not that bad. Or join us on Twitch every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We've been playing a lot of Valheim lately like the rest of the world. The game is super addictive, but uh, we'll be getting back to Final Fantasy XI as well as uh, our playthrough of Final Fantasy X and Persona 5 sometime soon because uh, it's been a blast. Oh my God, I totally forgot, guys. This is like one of the best places to have this effect. The amazing, like, glowing little... See, here's where I've got that... I, I, there's just the lightest hint of blue from the pool. Just a little bit but if we start raising this more you get a ton of that blue problem is it also gets super bright and like come on it's nighttime like it's not that bright <laughs> but play around with this setting like i said right now this actually doesn't even look that bad see how the tree itself has become a light source it's like a little yellow over here <laughs> like that's not right but you can get some really beautiful effects going on. I just have tried to find this weird balance between nighttime and daytime, which can be really hard. Maybe I'll try it for four for a little bit. We'll try it for. Let me know what you think of these settings uh, and whether or not you appreciated this video. I've had a lot of people asking me how was Final Fantasy XI working and getting the way that it is now in uh, 2021. And I was like, I guess it's different enough from the last time that I did one of these videos that I should probably go through it again and explain what's going on. Oh my God, I totally forgot. The font. Guys, in case you were wondering, this is also the Ash and Bubs HD font that came in the beta texture pack. Uh, it's just another one of the ROM files. You can just copy it over like anything else. Super easy to do. I wasn't sure if I'd appreciate it. Um, obviously the Final Fantasy XI fonts are kind of like particular. There's something that sort of just stuck with me for years and years, but it is really nice being able to easily read at a distance some of these NPC and uh, monster names because let's be honest, the old fonts like kind of tough to read didn't really uh, age that well. Otherwise, guys, uh, stay safe. Have a good one. I'll see you guys all in the next one. Peace. <laughs> Not you. This, this place just It's, it's, it's something. Passion. Also, it's something wait. Special. What are these things? They're AccuXs. They're AccuXs. I, I knew that was coming. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I don't know what I expected. What would Hunter say? They're <laughs> like raviolis. I've never seen this thing before in my life. They're blue